In the video last week, I talked about the necessity of using an API in a rack system in production. Today, I want to continue on that by showing you another example where we use fast API to get information who is actually doing the retrieval, what a person asks and how we can monitor our system in production. Monitoring a rack application is quite important because when users complain about incorrect answers, we ideally want to know who had the conversation with our LLM system and when, so we can identify and analyze it. To do that, we use Langchain, FastAPI and LangFuse, an open source alternative to LangSmith. Okay, I'm now in VS Code and as you see here on the left, the project itself is pretty small. It's just this Docker Compose YAML and main.py. So we focus on a very small detail, which is the authentication and monitoring process. So here is our Docker Compose YAML. We've got two services. The first one is LangFuse. There exists a LangFuse Docker image, which you can just download and use out of the box. It's pretty easy to use. It's completely open source with an MIT license, so this is why I prefer this package over LangSmith. The second image is PG Vector, which we use as our vector store, but in addition to that, also to store our users where we can register and log in. So we use it as normal SQL database and a vector store. Okay, now let's have a look at the main.py. And as you can see, we import here from different packages. Our main packages are FastAPI, LangChain, and SQL Alchemy. We start by importing our environment files, which we have here. So we create an OpenAI API key, a secret key for LangFuse, a public key for LangFuse, and also provide the host where we want to access LangFuse after we start the image. So this is done in this end file. Then we create a connection to the database. There we set up a user table, which is called chat users, where we save an ID, the username, and a hash password. We then create models for the API, user in and user out. This is what the API will re uh, return because we don't want to return any password information from the API. Then we set up a dependency, get db, which always sets up a fresh session when we access the database. And then after that, we set up everything we need for our vector store. So we create an instance of OpenAI embeddings, create our vector store, where we provide the collection name, connection string, and also the embedding function, which is an instance of OpenAI embeddings. And then we store a single document. This is just for demonstration purpose. Then we uh, convert the store into a retriever, create a template. This is a normal rec template, but in this case, we also add a third variable, which is name. So we always want the LLM to say hello, for example, like hello Tom, if the name of the user is Tom. We create a prompt template from that, create our model, and then we create our final chain. We then set up everything we need for fast API. So we use this context manager as lifespan manager to create our engine when the application starts. So we set up the connection to the database. We create an instance of the app, create an OAuth2 scheme to create an URL to log in. We also need a secret key to do this. And then we create two functions of authenticate user where you make a query against this user table and filter for the username and see if that's the name we provide here. We extract the first element and if it does not exist, we know that the user does not exist yet. Otherwise, we will return the user object. The second function is create access token. So when we log in, a standard way is to do that by a JSON web token. This JSON web co token contains information the information will be stored in the payload of the token and we will just use the data which we set as attribute here. So we will set the username, for example, inside the JSON web token so we can use it in an endpoint. We then create the get current user function which has got two dependencies. The first one is this OAuth2 scheme which makes a request to the token URL which we provide here. And there is uh, where we get the JSON web token and we also get in a new session as dependency in this function. We then can use the JWT library and use the decode method or decode function to decode the token. So by providing the secret key and also the hashing algorithm, we can extract the payload, which is a dictionary. And there we can just use the get method and extract the username. If the username is none, we want to raise an error. Otherwise, we want to check if that username we get here is in our database. So we make a query. So we filter by the username in our database, extract the first element and if it does not match, we want to raise an error. Then we know something is off. Otherwise, we want just to return the user. We then create two other functions. The first one just returns a length use object. And the second one uses this as dependency. So we get a length use instance and also get the user. 
And this is where we set the tracing. So, so we can set a user ID in the trace method and we will just set the username of our user object as user ID in this trace. So this runs every time we make a request to our API. Okay, then we've got our endpoints. The first one is the register endpoint where we can register a new user. We use our user in model, which has got a username and a password. We get a new session and now we first check if the user already exists in the database. If yes, we want to raise an error. Otherwise, we want to hash the password. Set this as hash password attribute in our table and then add the user to the database and then commit the session. And we only return the user with the username, but we of course won't return the hash password. The second one is this token endpoint. So this is where we log in. So here we use the OAuth2 password request form class from Langchain also get a new session. And then we authenticate the user by providing the username and the password. We check if that user exists. And it, if it does exist, we want to create a new access token and return that access token from our endpoint. The last endpoint is where all of the code we wrote before comes together. So we use the get current user function as dependency in this endpoint. So this is the user. We also provide the question and we also use the get trace handler function as dependency. So we've got the question, the user and our length use handler. So we pass as query question and the name and this will be used in our chain, which we created here. So we pass in the question and the name. The context will also make use of the question and we pass that to the retriever and so on. So we only have to provide two arguments, so name and question. And then we've got our final query, which we pass into the a invoke function. And length use is pretty easy to use. So we just have to provide this dictionary, which has got a callbacks key and we pass in a list of handler instances. So we only have to do minor modifications in our code to introduce length use in our code base. Then we get the result and return the result from our API. So now let's have a look at how this works. We're gonna create a new user and use the chat endpoint together. Okay, let's run docker compose up. This will now download the required images, so pg vector and also the length use package. Okay, length use and pg vector are running. So let's now run our fast API application. So we use UV icon to do that and run our app on port 8000. So this is the Swagger UI of fast API. So here we've got our three endpoints, register, token and chat. So first we're gonna create a new user and call the user John Doe and give it a password, which is test. So pretty easy. We can see that we created a new, a new user. If we want to try it again, we can see that the username already is registered. So let's get this information. Okay, so now let's chat. So to do that, we first have to log in. John Doe and test. Let's authorize. And this works. And now we can chat. So we ask how much does a pizza cost? If you remember, that was the first document we uh, saved in our vector store. And now we can see the response of the bot. Hello, John Doe, a pizza margarita costs $5. So this works. We see this is our name and we can also see the price of the pizza. Okay, so now let's go to Langfuse. The first time you go there, you have to create a new account. I already signed up with my account, so I can just sign in with my email and then use my password I created. And now we can go to users. And this is the interesting part here. So this offers a lot of uh, possibilities to analyze your application, but I'm just gonna show you that. So we've got this John Doe user. This is the user we just used here. And we create a new question. So we did it three times and now if you click at the user, we can see that we've got total traces, three, and total prompt tokens, total completion, and total cost of that user. We can click on traces and here we can see that we've got three traces with different IDs. We can see the timestamp. So very close to, so this was the first one, second one, and this was a very close 
third one, so let's try it again. And now we can see another one was added. So I think this is pretty convenient because I can directly see who is the user, when did the user make the request, and we can even drill down a little bit more. So we can click on this ID and we can see what code was executed. So we can see that this was just a runnable sequence. So we can see that the user, John Doe, asks how much does a pizza cost? And the answer was, hello, John Doe, a pizza margarita costs $5. So if there was an answer that was incorrect, we can directly track it down and see who made the question and what the answer was and when this happened. So this is a very nice and convenient way of monitoring your REC application. What interests us in a REC application is normally not just the question and the answer, but also if we've got any performance issues, what documents were retrieved. So we can see we only have got this single document multiplied four times, but yeah, that's it. So we can check here, does this question actually match somehow the documents we retrieved or if there is an error. So this is what also LangFuse is great for. Great, we are now at the end of the video and I hope you saw why we want to make use of an API in our REC application. It makes it easy to integrate other convenient services like LangFuse where we can do personalized monitoring. And this is what an API enables us to do. So thanks for watching, see you, bye bye.